Hi, everybody. I'm Sandeep. Uh, uh, I'm with all of our team, Pushpak. So there's Amit Garg, George Thomas, uh, Rishikesh Balal. So you can see some of them there will be presenting our concept of operations for uh, drones in India. And uh, we also have uh, Siddharth Ravi Kumar, Siddharth Shetty, uh, and Karthik, Karthik and Siddharth. Uh, oh, yeah, the last uh, ones I mentioned are from I spirit us uh, and we also have Manish Shukla. I'm not sure he's come in yet, but uh, hopefully he'll be joining us soon. So the format for today, I'll just go over that. Uh, before that, uh, we have I spirit Foundation, who sort of put us all together. We're trying to work through quite a few things, but they're essentially very long-term thinkers and uh, try to get get make uh, huge changes possible through so, uh, they're more of a software product round table that's that's my understanding anyway uh but maybe towards the end uh sid, sid or uh ravi could say a few words so yeah uh, as you, as you can see there's more of 30 year architects not not just five years in down right so today's uh the outline for today uh i'll be speaking a little bit about what the drone regulation space looks like right now, the evolution, uh, the applications that we want out of drones in the coming years and decades, uh, the missing pieces that we clearly see ahead of us, and how do we go ahead about, go about addressing these. Uh, then George will come in, he'll, he'll explain uh, what our concept of operations is, and this is where uh, feedback with the industry is important. We try, what we're trying to do through this series of talks is, uh, I mean, it's not just a talk, it's also a feedback session. We want to listen to what uh, everybody wants, not just uh, us. And that's why we said, okay, we should set these up so that we gather as much feedback as possible before sort of for the next version and so on. Uh, Rishikesh, obviously familiar to everybody uh, from the AeroBridge community is, uh, he'll be talking about the implementation, how do we take it from a concept to practice and, and come and detail the short and long-term roadmaps. Uh, finally, we'll have a QA and a uh, and with the pushback team, hopefully we'll all not be too, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll be happy to share our faces once, give, give, give a little bit of face time and uh, Rishi will be coordinating this. Obviously everybody can sort of jump in. Uh, so a few things before uh, we get started. Uh, for the Q&A, so there's a few links up there as QR codes. If you want to go ahead, open those up, and I'll just wait for a few minutes, a uh, few seconds, not minutes. Uh, the one on the right is uh, hopefully everybody can see my presentation. By the way, yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yes, so there's a few links being posted in the chat. So the, one of them is on the. Uh, the concept of operations article itself. So the core of what you're presenting today, the one on the right is for your feedback. Uh, anything you think of during the call, uh, just put it in there. We'll get to those towards the end and, and hopefully answer all of them. Uh, okay, so getting started, right? If anytime you need the links, please put it on chat and somebody will send you the right links. Okay. Um, so obviously, uh, there's a few interesting things that's happened in the last couple of months, uh, or maybe a bit more. So uh, geospatial mapping. So there's a new policy out by the government, which that they're opening up uh, mapping as a as a service. Uh, not it's not now, now it's not anymore just the purview of Survey of India, but private companies and come into the service. So that was a, a huge. Uh, sort of impetus for the drone industry to sort of push for liberalization. And that is why the drone rules 2021 came in after quite a bit of discussion and so forth. So geospatial mapping is, I think, one of the prime movers in, 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 in recent regulations. So as I said, last couple of months. Uh, obviously, the, the primary benefits include cost and time saving, uh, a, lot, a lot of hard, uh, I mean, much higher accuracy that's been possible over traditional uh, surveys, pre-programming uh, missions and so forth, and easier access to hard reaching, I mean, 
areas which are difficult to survey for, uh, on foot, for example. Uh, and then for specific domain, domain specific applications like mining and so forth, you can put on lots of specific sensors, which, which give you better data, more suited to your exact tasks. Right? Uh, precision agriculture is another, so uh, crop health monitoring, spraying for, uh, uh, and deploying pesticides, fertilizers. Uh, these, these are the primary applications that we look for at, at an all India scale. So enhancing these using drone tech is obviously a primary focus. So first two, I think, are these. Uh, these, are, these are the more long-term uh, goals, I think. Uh, efficient last mile logistics where we can put in drones for uh, delivery in the urban areas even and the remote areas where setting up a standard uh, logistics chain is actually very cost prohibitive. So uh, aside from the security applications and innovations where India has traditionally been a bit behind the times, we are now catching up. Uh, through a uh, lot of R and D within uh, within the Indian defense side, and they're opening up a lot of uh, channels with R and D uh, institutions and so forth. So clearly, there's there's a way ahead for us for the drone industry, right? So that is what we've been trying to accomplish over the past, uh, let's say, eight years. So this is what we've we've noted down is uh, the evolution of drone regulations in India. So we I think we started off a long while back, somewhere in the 19, end of 1980s. So we uh, imported drones for uh, the Kargil war. And then since then, obviously drone operations have been limited, very limited uh, to, say, to say the least, um, and uh, essentially non-existent till about 2014. But uh, around 2014, uh, we actually went a step back instead of saying, okay, let's, enabled drone op uh, operations, there was actually a blanket ban for about four years. Although in intermediate, as you can see from 2014 uh, uh, through till 2018, we had a couple of uh, policy papers, uh, more of drafts that were trying to get us to the stage where drone operations and take off, uh, but we never quite reached there till about 2018. So iSpirit was very deeply involved in those early discussions and and finally we got to uh, a car which is uh, the the requirements specification for operations for our pass uh, what what our passes are obviously i'm sure everybody's familiar but for our discussion we'll draw a quick dis uh, a distinction maybe a little bit later uh, between our pass and uas's anyway so uh, okay we got to a stage around October August of 2018, where there was this whole concept of NPNT secure operations, uh, secure firmware, secure software, which most of you are already familiar with. And uh, there was this, uh, for uh, there was a, a guidance manual published alongside it. And finally, Digital Sky was launched in, the, in December of 2018. Uh, moving ahead, since, uh, since then, uh, there's a, been a little, uh, I mean, Things have been slowly gaining momentum in the industry sides, but on the policy end, nothing much happened till about uh, 2020 June when there was a draft US rules published and then uh, UTM policy. So which is a next logical step for uh, enabling even more drones to take off, right? Uh, again, these are all in draft stages. Finally, these got notified, but I think since March of 2021. So uh, if you look at this, these uh, regulations, so they were pretty uh, exhaustive. And I think, uh, I mean, in my personal opinion, and maybe <laughs> to some extent, even the group's opinion, uh, were, uh, were fairly ex uh, detailed. And to say that, uh, which had a direct implication of not being easily implementable on the ground. So, uh, after a lot of industry feedback, we actually went the opposite way. So, so 2018 to 2020, uh, basically we reversed our position from a security heavy uh, uh, policy to uh, say a very liberal policy, a more industry focused policy in 2021, uh, August 
uh, of which we actually published uh, uh, final drone rules, right? Which is notified. And then we have this, uh, the revised airspace map come in and so forth. So this is where we are right now. But as you can see, <laughs> the, all through the journey, it's been about seven plus years. We are still waiting for a lot of things, right? So um, usually, the way it works is you have a policy in place. Policy says, okay, this is how uh, technology should take off. And then there's somebody who needs to come in and say, define the technical standards or specifications and then provide reference implementation, at least on software or hardware. Uh, and these are still uh, either under discussion or, or uh, I mean, some are active, some are uh, not so active, but either way, there's nothing serious that's come up and has been notified by uh, the DGCA or the ministry uh, as ref uh, as standards, right? So, which is, so four major things which we are still awaiting standards on assembly, design, manufacturing. So some of you guys will already be fairly aware of what's missing here. Uh, pilot licensing is another huge issue. Uh, remote ID, which is going to be very important in large-scale drone applications and finally, uh, unmanned traffic management. So uh, we'll come to unmanned traffic management in our possibly next few discussions, but the roadmap is still, uh, yeah, we're still stuck in a stage where we're not even come to, the, uh, <laughs> come to a point where we need unmanned traffic management uh, from, a, from, from the industry point of view, right? Which is uh, a bit sad, but anyway, so what our group said, okay, let's uh, try and figure out what's wrong. So how do we fill in the gaps, right? So this uh, policy looks good on the, on the surface. So we actually sat down, analyzed it and figured out. Uh, so we have an article on, uh, on uh, it's, it's a commentary on the drone rules uh, 2021. So maybe it's, it's linked in towards the end. So you can have a look after the call. Uh, and then we sort of worked backwards and said, okay, what essentially is missing is something which links all the policies together. So there is a, there is a, a distinct lack of a core concept, right? So which is what pretty much every, everywhere else. So US, uh, the EU, everybody uh, first actually came up with, okay, these are our basic assumptions about what uh, drone flights will look like in the future. And then they brought on policy and technical standards all followed from that core document, right? So, uh, which is what we started off with. So we said, okay, let's build out uh, a concept document. And uh, so some of the points here, which we'll be trying to address, right? Uh, as either corrections or improvements, uh, we'll, we'll get to how these actually link back to a concept document in, in a little bit when George takes over. But uh, th these are our core arguments for, against, or maybe criticisms on the drone rules 2021 uh, and the, and to some extent, even the previous regulations. So some of them, for example, type certification, which says, okay, this drone, this, this drone model, it, uh, it's, uh, it's airworthiness has been certified by somebody, possibly QCI uh, or, or a testing agency that there have been no standards laid down Everybody's expecting these standards to come out somehow, but uh, nobody has a clear straight line path to when or how that's going to happen. Uh, then uh, there is a lack of, I would say, yeah, a long-term vision in terms of how airspace is going to be managed uh, or for that matter, integrated integration between uh, unmanned and manned aviation. So that's, that's uh, essentially missing even from the current drone rules. Uh, business confidentiality is one which will play a key factor because uh, it will hamper people who are actually benefiting or even trying to take off, right, as, as businesses and corporations and so forth. Uh, so aside from that import policy, I'm sure all of you are well aware that uh, it doesn't talk too much. They've said, okay, we need this, uh, uh, this body uh, which enables uh, policy um, policy making and tries to promote drone uh, drone policy but uh, what about imports so that there's critical components which need to be imported and how do you we understand that imports is going to play a critical role for 
next few years. But how do we get to a stage where drone, uh, the drone in ecosystem in India is not just self-sustaining, but actually exporting uh, hardware, software, the whole stack, and not just that, services based on top of all these. Uh, so hopefully, uh, so again, few early thoughts, there's a lot more uh, specifically regarding insurance and training. So mostly the, the thought process, I think behind the, the current draft, uh, the current uh, drone rules are they're mandating insurance and training pretty much for every type of drone operation, maybe not nano, but above that, uh, which is, uh, I wouldn't say it's not prohibitive, but it, it needs uh, the industry to come up to a certain standard, which it isn't at yet. Uh, so it might actually delay uh, drone operations taking off, but maybe a few new, few good things in like in the last couple of days, honestly, we'll hope, uh, we hope that will, uh, especially for the insurance uh, side, we hope that those will push things forward a little bit. Uh, finally, um, so ultimately the, the one of the goals like for becoming an Atmanirbhar country, Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, what we want is we want to encourage R&D, but these, uh, these can only be done when you enable more experimentation, let, let private companies come in and test their products, test the services, make sure that they're up to a certain standard demanded by the industry. And that is what we want to see more of. So there's a little bit lacking in this uh, on this end uh, to encourage hobby flyers, to encourage uh, uh, private innovators. But we hope uh, we've, we've uh, uh, jotted all these down in, in our commentary doc. Uh, hopefully over the course of uh, our own interactions with policymakers, I mean, starting off from today, essentially, <laughs> we'll be able to uh, push some of these problems and get them to a point where we start solving these problems. Uh, fine, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, aside from that, obviously we need this feedback loop where uh, things that are going wrong or bad actors essentially are penalized, good actors are rewarded, and that, that system doesn't come across very clearly in the drone rules as it stands currently. But, but we'll, we'll, we have to keep going through iterations hopefully with better and better rules uh, that, that allow this to happen. Uh, I mean, NPNT has always been a sore, a sore issue. Uh, I think uh, Rishi will talk more about it towards the end, but one thing that did come across clearly is we need a sort of uh, anchoring body or, or a, a vehicle of sorts that will be able to take all, uh, all the drone industry issues uh, and policy making and uh, technical standardization that needs to happen but hasn't happened to date and, and put it under one entity. Also, what we actually suggested in our article was a SPV, something of the sort of GSTN and NPCI could, could actually do this. Uh, and finally, uh, how, how, how does such a body, even if it is actually set up, would, how does it actually get to the stage where uh, policy making drone uh, the the industry everybody's on the same page which currently it is they, they're not clearly right so um, so either way so whenever such discussions actually start off you need some sort of basic framework which is what is typically termed as a concept of operations and that is what we hope to get into today a little bit and then iterate and improve over time, right? Okay, so what is the concept of operations? It's essentially, uh, it's, it's, it's a proposed system which tries to en enable as many stakeholders as possible, integrate the viewpoints and not just that, it's sort of the, it's, it's basically a set of assumptions which are not going to change in the next few years, which clearly in terms of policy making, as you see, if, uh, we've had this uh, rocky road situation where we had security heavy first, then we had uh, industry heavy second. Now we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So, uh, but a concept of, of operations is meant to lay out the groundwork for say, I mean, not just a 30 year time frame, but even more possibly, right? Uh, 
uh, yeah, so then what we, it's, it's a very basic document, right? So it says, okay, what does this stakeholder need to get its business up and running? What does the regulator need? What does the uh, industry, uh, uh, industrialist need? What does an entrepreneur need? What does a research and development person need? And then try to cobble them together some, into something. And it's not technical, not too technical. It, it does have a little bit of uh, detail that we'll cover today. And, and uh, finally, it, it's a useful tool that brings about uh, consensus quickly. So, uh, and clearly that's not yet happened in India. So we hope that this document will actually help going forward. Uh, right, so uh, it can have, since it's, uh, it's the bare bones of a policy, uh, so basically the CONOPS informs the policy, policy informs technical standards, technical standards inform how uh, these softwares, hardwares get integrated, services are built on top of all these. So, and uh, it sort of eliminates this, uh, information pooling at various parts of the ecosystem tries to bring everything into one one uh, overarching concept so uh, it can have huge impact right so that's that's primarily why we are suggesting that there should be a conops effort uh, right now especially because we have a policy in place but we're not very sure where it's going ahead from there um, and uh, finally yeah so there's bottlenecks that we see coming uh, so clearly with the UTM policy, we're not sure how it will integrate with the drone policy. The more futuristic stuff becomes much more streamlined, essentially. Uh, there's a key distinction which one, <laughs> which uh, the regulation, uh, people who are more involved in regu uh, regulation and policy making keep bringing up. So there's this concept of UAS, RPAS, uh, and a model aircraft. Uh, both in unmanned and un and manned. Uh, in unmanned specifically, uh, so remote piloted and un uh, versus unmanned. So that distinction is what I mean. We'll use repeatedly. So that's why sort of highlighting it here. Uh, specifically, a remote piloted aircraft uh, or RPAS are those unmanned aircraft systems which are obviously remote remote piloted, but act actually match the sa safety standards of manned aircraft. Right, so they are technically capable and I mean certified to this. Uh, this sorry, did somebody had I heard a ping somewhere? Anyway, I'll keep going. So um, yeah, so this is where basically RPAS are systems which can operate in the same airspace as manned aviation, uh, as manned aircraft. Right, so safety standards are at par. Uh, whereas un uh, un this is not required of unmanned aircraft systems are much more general, maybe much more lower cost, not as high at on the safety. Uh, so this is the ICAO def definition of UAS versus RPAS. I'm sure we'll cover it in more detail later, but essentially it says, okay, uh, the, the operating conditions uh, for an RPAS can, they can work together with manned aviation essentially. Right. Uh, not so for unmanned aircraft, uh, unmanned aircraft system or UAS. Okay, so model aircraft are those which uh, usually are uh, not not for commercial use, more for educational, hobby, recreational purposes, uh, even training if it's in a private environment. Uh, and this is they have limited scopes, uh, usually VLOS kind of operations and. They, yeah, payload is usually optional. So it's not focused on the payload. It's more about experimentation. So uh, we'll, we'll use this towards the end. Uh, I mean, in the, in our actual conops as well. Right, uh, so this is where, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody already knows these categorizations for weight categories, uh, but it, it is a pity that even despite this categorization, they've not actually used it and brought it into, uh, I mean, in terms of the drone rules, uh, there's no specific provisions made for uh, higher, higher weight categories and how do they relate to safety standards or airworthiness and so forth. Uh, and there is a little bit of a gap between nomenclature, uh, interna uh, internationally, and we are clearly borrowing some stuff from uh, outside 
but uh, that nomenclature has not translated fully. Uh, anyway, so uh, to enable all these different applications that we have and foresee in the coming uh, decades, right? So we most uh, uh, the, our group sort of felt that most of these applications can be served using rotary wing, and that is where uh, we focused our concept more on. Uh, obviously, some of them actually need a fixed wing uh, solutions, and we'll get to those. Uh, but we're trying to enable. We're not saying don't do it, but uh, we're trying to enable rotary wing first, right? That's that's our way of thinking. Uh, maybe you have comments to, to post those. Uh, so this is where uh, George will come in and he'll start going through how what are our guiding principles and uh, he'll, he'll uh, then move on to the actual concept of operation. So I'm, I hope I'm not taking too much time. George, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Sain. Uh, okay. Actually, you have taken a lot of... Uh, I, oh my god off, okay. my, off my shoulders because you already laid the base for okay announce. excellent excellent that's good that's uh, hi that's everyone good. uh good evening this is george um, and like what he was mentioning helicopter and the drones they have got a lot of similarities and that's where i come in because i've been in the helicopter stream and flying as a helicopter pilot for a long time so from my point of view a concept of concept of operations are being brought in so let's first talk about uh, about the regulations per se uh, the regulations, when we establish one, there should be looking at four different characteristics. They are efficiency, safety, security, and the infrastructure constraints. Actually, the regulation should be able to pave the way to enhance the efficiency in deployment of drones without compromising on safety of humans and assets. However, they also should be able to stem the use of drones by people who threaten the security of other personnel, other population and the nation also, which you have seen recently, which has been happening there. But it should also take into consideration the constraints of infrastructure, because it should not be just uh, open for everyone to start operating without considering these facts. And the infrastructure, like we are talking about the UTM for establishing the ETM infrastructure, we don't have. So those should be considered also. So while going into that, uh, what we need to see is that for the efficiency, the regulations should need to be UI centric and not lean upon whatever the experience we have had from the manned deviation. So um, there is that is where we come in to suggest that the simple regulations are required with minimal compliance costs, which are which can provide a fillip to the industry, and uh, it attract investments, especially from the Indian industry. And it encourages the legitimate use for anyone who is interested in doing it. And also, it gives us enough time to, for evolving standards, and which are easier to comply and um, follow on for a longer period of time. Also, efficient regulations will enable development of market capacity and further innovations. And um, the benefit will be maximum for small and medium enterprises, where the gestation period will be minimal. and Regulations also would ensure that the drones are attractive to a wide spectrum of users and um, you would find its utilization in more in the future. Next slide, please. Sign. Well, so in the safety uh, in, in the safety field, what the regulations should be addressing is it should be progressive integration is required into the existing aviation system because it is a manned aviation where the controlling is going to be uh, interaction between uh, humans and machines, whereas for drones, it will be more of mechanized control. So there is a, we need to look at the safety factor, and therefore the regulations must be able to minimize the risk to the safety of people and assets, but also it needs to uh, meet the obligations as per the ICAO towards safety. Then uh, when we come up to the later stages of uh, mingling with the manned aircraft in the uh, non-segregated airspace, we're required to meet the safety and operational standards there too. So that is going to be a big jump in case we start immediately getting into that aspect. Alternatively, initially US operations must be restricted to this is what we recommend in that the specific conditions like VLOS or the visual line of sight operations or operated only in the segregated airspace outside the operational ambit of manned aircraft. 
or always utilize it in specific areas away from heavily populated areas also so that the safety is ensured so basically what we are trying to say is the rules must be must express the objectives of the nation and also complemented by the industry standards so when we go to the next slide it is when you are considering security we all all of us in this uh, panel will be aware that we have had a long history of convention of I an mean, uh, history and interaction with subconventional warfare in the form of anti national activities and because this is become a, a main a tool in the latest uh, last few years now for use for the tool for disgruntled elements and uh, the security establishment is likely to be getting saturated very soon to identify between who are the good ones and who are the bad actors who are roaming around in the air, in the airspace close to these establishments and near the borders so what we suggest is that the us need to be initially limited to those categories which are easily identifiable and also incapable of keeping a significant incapable of giving a significant harm to anyone on the ground and uh, uh, what we need to also remember is regarding the personal privacy because uh, drones can easily be an eavesdropper and uh, we need to ensure that the protection of public interest in this particular aspect too next next slide okay um regarding the infrastructure issues that um, developing the utm concepts and the infrastructure is crucial for the large scale of operation of uh, unmanned aircraft systems so the uas traffic management or the utm will be based on each uas or the drone let's call it for transmitting a unique remote id with a geo tracking feature and uh, the utm systems for very low level segregated airspace accommodating exclusive uas traffic where the manned aircraft are unlikely to be operating except maybe the helicopters and very short time of landing and another one which we are uh, what we foresee is that uas need to be uh, in non non segregated controlled airspace they have to meet the safety requirement and of manned aircraft standards so these are the challenges of integration into the manned aircraft uh, manned airspace where we would have to do a lot of deep thinking and bringing in uh, taking a little time to go into incremental steps development of us market and related technologies need to be uh, need to be carefully monitored and we need to plan ahead for the safe integration but where is what is very fundamental in this infrastructure would be the telecom spectrum available for this particular use next the concepts so the suggested conops for india what we discussed amongst ourselves and uh, what we put across here is incremental approach rather than a long uh, jump straight into the unmanned aviation of uh, bvlers so we require the com commences commencement of operations immediately where the risks are minimized but and the growth is also moderated to manageable limits so we have um, suggested a risk and capability based approach into four categories as given on the slide there category a will be the basic us operations with the least amount of risk and the next one will be productive operations with minimal risk i will explain these things subsequently and uh, category c what we have suggested is advanced us operations posing intermediate risk and the last one the final one which should be after some time is a full range regulated us operations with risk mitigation mitigation completely done next so let me explain a little more about this category a what we have suggested is the one which has least amount of risk and the least infrastructure like the small uas which are utilized for photography and videography these are the ones which should be able to take off immediately and uh, the op suggested operational boundaries here are uh, they should be operating in vo vo loss that is visual line of sight only and at a safe distance away from people animals infrastructure and aerodromes and these should be in segregated airspace only till a maximum specific maximum height 
and uh, above ground level. And the capability should be limited with design within a specific performance limit, like what we have talked about is mass and speed, because that is the one which will, on the, the impact of which will be causing injury and damage, and the rate of climb, rate of descent, extra. But here, in this particular category, there won't be any UTM support required. Therefore, we should be able to start immediately. The next slide. So for category B is uh, how the operations are unlikely to result in fatality or cause serious injury or damage to persons or infrastructure on the ground. Example, small UAS, which are utilized for survey and uh, agriculture purposes, which will be having limited regulatory restrictions that protect other airspace uses and the life and property on the ground. That's what we expect. And we require a limit supporting infrastructure, but can be undertaken without a UTM in a more restricted way. So what we recommend to achieve this is by defining the operational boundaries. And what are the operational boundaries? We are coming into the next slide. So the operational boundaries we define are here in that these drones or the UAS should be operated only by a, re a qualified remote pilot within the VLOS or extended VLOS. It will be operated safely away from people, animals, buildings, and aerodromes, and in a segregated airspace. So we are catering for safety in most of the ways because this is the first time when it is going in where safety can be a big issue. And operations are not going to be involving carriage of dangerous goods or any articles. And it should be having mandatory identification features with which others who are on the ground will be able to identify. And the US capability here will be also limited by design with specific performance limit, like what I said before, the mass speed, ceiling, the rate of climb and descent. This will, all, this will also be undertaken like in Cat, B, Cat A, in fair weather conditions and away from security sensitive areas. Coming to Cat C, here we are opera operations will be utilizing larger or heavier US with more payload capacity, but posing no chain challenge to the manned aircraft. Example, it will be using BB loss operations in segregated airspace for package delivery. So for that, there has to be corridors which require to be made also. There'll be low potential uh, to cause any fatality or uh, injury to a person on the ground, but it will have safety challenges, which will be for uh, by restricting itself to the segregated airspace. They'll have limits on payload, but in pilot qualifications will be required. Airspace restrictions will be there. Altitudes, airspeed will also be limited. Proximity to aerodromes and congested or populated areas. So, and uh, this requires specific risk assessment based on authorization that will lead to specific limitations adapted to the operation. How it comes up, we'll be discussing in subsequent slides. So the operational limitations here will be also again by a trained remote pilot, safe distance from people, animals, buildings, and aerodromes are required to be done in segregated airspace only. So we still haven't gone into the manned aircraft area so far. Enhanced UAS capability, but limited by design within specific limits as given. But here, what we suggest and we recommend is that there has to be adequate UTM infrastructure to control this traffic. So till that time we need to hold on. And category D will be the advanced application with negligible restrictions on size, the area or complexity of operation or use of airspace. That is air taxi operation is an example which lots of nations are trying to start soon. But it includes with appropriate mitigations, BB loss operations within controlled airspace. And US should be able to confirm the well-established design characteristic would require a significant risk mitigation measures. Next. So for this category D, the operation, operators will have to have adequate management structure to ensure safe operation as and also for assessment of risk mitigation. Licensed remote pilots who are issued licenses after success, successfully completing the practical training we suggest should pass a knowledge test, meet specific medical standards also, and age requirements. 
UAS will need to be maintained in a safe state of flight and be subject to design standards or other airworthiness certifications, very similar to the ones which the DGCA and other institutions take upon manned aircraft now. And uh, this aircraft may be required to be marked, registered, and be able to track continually by the, the management, the UTM managers, as well as the airspace managers also. And the operations rules applicable to this category should be really extensive. It will be quite a few. And there are other aspects and the time factors. I will hand over to Rishi, who will continue with the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, well, welcome, everyone. Um, what I want to talk about is this um, the concept of operations and its implementation together. Um, concept of operation is useful because, as you see here, we have uh, classified uh, different operations into different categories, A, B, C, and D. Uh, where, where it helps is basically when you start to think about what operations will you want to allow or not allow. Now, as far as the implementation is concerned, there are many challenges, as everybody knows. The first being, uh, for example, the capacity of the regulator. Uh, you are entering a very technical space with sort of many actors. Does the regulator have the capacity to, to audit and sort of oversee all of this? Then we have the sort of the sort of the technical capability of Airports Authority of India, which is the ANSP, for example. And so some of these challenges are not going to be solved immediately. They will require some time to ease out. And of course, in a technology setting, uh, things will move very fast. So we are kind of lucky in that. But the idea here is to segregate and start thinking about implementation from a point of short, medium, and long term. Um, essentially, when you start to group operations in different categories, it gives you a roadmap to start prioritizing certain operations while the technology and the institutions catch up. So what we are suggesting, again, this is a suggestion uh, for the moment, is that we start in a step-by-step -step approach. And the first one being permit category A and restricted category B uh, uh, operations immediately, which is basically enabling hobby photography, uh, agricultural mapping, and so on. Now, once we, we, we have that, there is no need for a UTM or any of that in place when you start thinking about category A and category B, which is without the UTM. Then we know that the UTM policy is coming. Uh, basically, once that comes, then you start to uh, introduce the full range of category B and C operations. And then eventually, uh, in the medium term, uh, you start uh, thinking about UAM and so on. So what we're trying to say here is that certain operations with certain sort of operational boundaries be allowed uh, as we progress in the ecosystem. If you look at the draft rules at the moment, we are sort of allowing a lot of operations. And the problem with that is that the security establishment airports will get a little bit overwhelmed. So what we're suggesting is uh, having a step-by-step -step approach with this. Uh, just to elaborate further, next slide, please. Uh, if you start to look at the category A ops, very, very simple rules. Uh, everybody who has flown a drone uh, would be uh, familiar with them. Have a VLOS, a small drone, uh, operate at uh, you know 60 meters or 200 feet and so on. Uh, so these are the operations that we can start immediately uh, in the green zone, for example, used for ho hobby flying and photography. Of course, you don't permit these operations near airports and so on. So any integration with their space is not needed, let's say. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for category B uh, zone, which are restricted, which is basically do not need any UTM system, uh, which is a little bit more sort of advanced operations, uh, a bit of heavier drone operated under VLOS or enhanced VLOS, and sort of, again, away from people and animals, you can do your farming and photography and so on. These are the simplest operations uh, to perform. And what we are saying is you should allow that immediately. You don't need UTM for this. You don't need uh, sort of very, very, you know, expert pilots or so on, because these are fairly simple operations. Then uh, we start to get into a little bit of uh, what you would call as uh, Restricted category B, next slide, please. Uh, basically, they will talk about, um, you know, you start to get into the operational complexity of training. Uh, maybe the pilot needs to be trained a little bit. 
maybe uh, they they can sort of go in uh, in sort of the the yellow zones let's say you know not not the ones near the airports but you know beyond that and so on so you start basically with a and b and then you increase the complexity eventually so again this will come uh, maybe uh, when the utm policy comes up and it is mature so just having a policy of course is not useful you need to give it some time to bake and then maybe six months down the line you enable these second type of operations and then eventually category b and c type of operations so this is the sort of the roadmap that our group thought would be useful where you classify operations and then you say some are are easy and sort of have minimal risk allow them now and then as we progress uh, you sort of uh, open up uh, the operations now this is these four categories are useful and we are very open to suggestions and this sort of conops is kind of a document which should be with you for a long long time so this doesn't change every year or every month depending on the operation but having this framework of operational categories helps you in the long run now in addition to the conops uh, next slide bit addition to the categories uh, basically obviously uh, anybody who is a manufacturer is aware of sort of uh, the issues with uh, design and manufacturing uh, and so the conops also talks about uh, you know uh, how how uh, the design standards are met if there is a unique id uh, and the manufacturer has some responsibility as far as uh, traceability and so on are concerned so these are sort of uh, you know in addition to the operation you are sort of laying down some rules for the categories as well uh, the design of the, the aircraft as well so uh, the next slide please uh, and so because we are starting with fairly simple operations of a and b it helps everyone in that you don't need a lot of training for a and b you can watch a youtube video or some let's say professional course on learning how to fly and then you can start so this sort of satisfies the need for getting the drones in the air and so the point there being that for relatively easy risk-free um, uh, uh, flying or flights there is no need to undergo any specific formal training and so on so maybe an online exam is enough and also uh, it helps the regulator in trying to manage some of these things so that you're not all of a sudden imposing trainings for very simple things as well. Um, the next slide, please. Um, and then as we get uh, with the UTM policy and that matures and so on, uh, basically you can have training uh, by QCI identified uh, pilots and uh, courses and so on. So what we're saying is for category A and B operations, simple ones don't have any training. For C and D, start to really think about the extensive training and restricted B might be somewhere in the middle. So again, this helps in understanding how you can start to implement some of these, uh, these policies by identifying the operations that you want to enable. And then the next, uh, the next slide, please. This is an ongoing sort of a, uh, sort of a thing uh, about airworthiness compliance and essentially what we are trying to say is that if you're enabling operations a and b in category a and b which is inherently less risky then you should essentially remove the airworthiness compliance certification because you're not doing these operations in a very complicated way these are you know glorified toys you can think of it like that next slide please um and then as as we mature basically we might need to sort of work on uh, things like import policy formulation drone categories uh, insurance and and so on so the idea here being that instead of the current approach of just allowing or not allowing certain kind of things uh, maybe we should incentivize uh, assembly but not uh, sort of uh, incentivize import of drone models and so on so this this notion that you uh, sort of work on these concepts over time and you can do that because now you have the kind of operations you want to allow and you have categorized these operations will help us in the long term and uh, one of the things that we identify uh, is this creation of this uh, maybe a SPV or something like that a regulatory authority that enables uh, some of these in the long term uh, and they've talked about GST and, and so on so something like that uh, the, the drone council for India or something like that which firstly adopt these conops and these conops are let's say a living document in participation with the industry and so on and then uh, starts working on these in a step-by-step -step fashion uh, in these categories next slide please um, 
Now, this is the sort of the, the, uh, the long-term sort of uh, need that we will have. So I guess one of the things that we're trying to do with this CONOPS is to prepare Indian ecosystem for the long term. So just because you have a UTM policy doesn't mean that that will be the same in two years or five years or 10 years, right? You will need to sort of continuously work on these. And that's why I would like to say that these CONOPS are living documents, right? And this is the ethos of this, where this is not a one-time thing. We will continue to update and improve this. And the idea here being when you have these institutionalized within an SPV or within a living CONOPS document or something like that, you can start to identify things. And here's a list of some of the immediate things that we have sort of identified, development of a uh, sort of an advisory committee uh, from different stakeholders. This is very similar to the FAA, what they are doing. Uh, envision how things like urban air mobility, which is category D and beyond operations lie and so on. So essentially what this CONOPS document does is classify operations and then provides you a framework to work with once these things change. So the idea here is that UTM technologies are at a certain level today, and we understand that at 25, there will be a certain different level, and we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel every four or five years. And that's really the, the point of these CONOPS. And we are trying to seed these ideas and make these CONOPS a living document so that we have some reference to go back to every time there is a policy change or a technology change and so on. Yeah, and that's the, that's the final sort of a slide. Uh, basically, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would uh, sort of uh, just welcome uh, any questions and answers. Uh, this is a living document, and you, this is the first session that we are co conducting after months of sort of back and forth and so on. And the idea here is to develop these robustly that we have considered a lot of things, and then finally sort of have that in place. You know, uh, as we mentioned earlier, FAA and EASA and others have one. India doesn't, and we are trying to establish that. And so this takes time, but the idea here is that the first steps have been taken. Yeah, with that, I'm just going to stop. And uh, uh, maybe uh, we can start with questions and answers. Uh, you can type in the chat box, uh, what do you think? And uh, maybe just open it up on the floor. I think we already have a couple of questions in, uh, maybe in the Q&A on Zoom itself. Could you just go through those first, Rishi? Yeah, um, so the first question is from uh, uh, Dr. Rajiv Narang sir, hello. Um, are you thinking of including how should engineers and innovators be educated and trained? Uh, are you thinking of including recommendations? Um, so let me sort of, before me answering it, let me just open it up to the panel. Let's take this one by one. Uh, does- I think Amit do these... is also, uh, maybe we can join on mic or video Amit, if you want instead of typing in there. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, um, Ansh. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I was, uh, uh, there were other questions which I thought uh, he had put in. So, uh, 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 Naring sir makes a very, very valid point. And, uh, we, uh, but the issues are that that this today's session, we have been focusing more on, on introducing this idea of a concept of operations, because as of now, all the attempts that are being made on policy have been focused towards uh, 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 trying to give in a policy without having a comprehensive picture or without having a vision for the bigger picture. And so that tends to create a fractured uh, or, or a very limited approach. And, and therefore, some of these solutions which are uh, or policy decisions that uh, come out are not uh, maybe as robust. And so uh, on these specific questions that you've raised in the last one on how engineers and innovators should be educated and trained, definitely, again, uh, very valid points. But then uh, for us, our, our bigger priority is to get the uh, low hanging fruit, the drones which can fly, get airborne, so that that helps generate a legitimate use, a legitimate industry takes birth. And then we keep uh, helping to uh, the industry to grow. Right now, the problem that is happening is uh, if you're doing anything, you, you're practically doing it Ill illegally. There's, there's so many uh, bottlenecks in the regulations that you have to navigate. So, so that's what we are we're trying to uh, generate support with, with that thought. And uh, when it comes to the finer issues about how training will be done or what technologies are required, they, they, can, uh, they are very important, but we possibly need to 
take them on as we first sow our seeds, so to say. I hope uh, I, I've uh, been able to give you some response. So I think uh, you missed the second question on uh, airborne and ground technologies. Yeah, I, I think I'm trying to say the same thing that, that okay. uh, uh, th yeah, th these are important issues. All of them are very important issues, but uh, to be answered or, or given uh, due time and effort in, in a little later frame of uh, time frame. Yeah, I think what Amit is also trying to say with this is that um, a so, concept uh, of if you don't mind, uh, if, if uh, uh, Mr. Narayan would like to speak, please, I think your mic is already enabled from us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my only uh, concern is I've been following what Pa has been doing. Uh, when I authored my book, I wrote a paper, Regulatory and Technological Challenges in Integration of Drones in Non-Segregated Airspace. So I deliberated at some of the things. The approach between India and other countries is we do not have a proactive uh, R&D plans or programs to integrate drones in India. We are expecting industry to come up with some of the solutions. Uh, whereas if you see uh, some of the initiatives taken by ASA, AKPA, so what's happening is uh, uh, we, uh, our regulators or our uh, uh, operators, um, then wait for the industry where, which is getting technologies from mostly from the Western experiences, because we have many Indians working in the Western uh, world. Uh, they are able to get those technologies by modifying it and give it to us. Uh, proactiveness in this aspect is missing. So I think there is a scope for us to at least uh, sensitize our, uh, our uh, uh, stakeholders that they have to take some initiative. So that was my concern. And when I speak to some of the educational institutions in India, uh, not many people are uh, doing. Some people are doing based on individual professors. So there is not a coherent mechanism. In China, they have a full-fledged uh, 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 BTEC system in Chinese uh, civil airspace uh, university. Similarly, there is a uh, 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 what's a, uh, that U.S. Uh, uh, university uh, Red Lease. They have a dedicated and very focused uh, uh, mechanism of educating future generations. So as a result. So I think this is the area if we have a lot of people last six years I've been commenting in everybody said let's catch a low hanging fruit. So effectively we are not addressing some of the core issues. That's the point. Thanks. That's a fantastic point raised. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much. I think uh, one of the reasons we are uh, so we put ice spirit right at the top there. Uh, maybe uh, Sid could come in and explain how I spirit will help with these long term visions, putting the right stakeholders, setting up the right conversations, because that is what they do, honestly. As individual, uh, say, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, say, unmanned aviation enthusiasts or regulators, it's very difficult to set up on our own, right? That is what I spirit does. Maybe sit, uh, is, if, if you're here, would you like yes. to say a few things? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, absolutely. And, and thank you so much for your feedback, Aram. So, in fact, it, it's been a while since we last connected. Yeah. Uh, uh, quite a few years. But, uh, but you're spot on. And, and therefore, I spirit is in some sense. financial inclusion and taking a trickier view of this playground. Given logistics and national security reasons, it's important that India takes that long-term view. And our attempt is to incubate these problems over that long term. And therefore, some of these questions that you're raising Sid, I think we're losing your audio. To come together, which of course over a period. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, uh, I think you'll have to repeat a little bit. Hello, <laughs> you might have to repeat. Yeah, it. yeah. Uh, we lost you for a quick, like you know, ten seconds, maybe. 
Sure. So what I was saying is, and, and therefore the intent out here, uh, is to take a 20 to 30 of you off the drones playground in India, uh, and then to anchor the various conversations and developments in that context. And so, of course, step one is ensuring that on the integration side of drones into civilian airspace, there is a base framework. And within that, of course, that base framework allows for legalizing existing operations in a safe, secure manner, which is what got shared in the call. Because we must also realize that once that activity picks up, that creates the momentum for a lot of the other developments to take place as well. That means, you know, you can now start thinking of more advanced traffic management systems. Uh, you can think about how do you have automated collision avoidance? You can think about right. what do drone ports look like? So therefore, we need to incubate those problems in a research context, but for them to really see commercial success. Uh, what happens in the US and EU, European regions or China is because they've opened up their markets for base operations, the market is now ready for more advanced operations. And if we don't do that in India, then what will happen is the research that can take place in these advanced operations will not get commercialized in that context. And they will have to look outside India because we are still stuck, focused on trying to get remotely piloted operations up and running. So, so that's my perspective on it. Uh, and we should take a long-term view. I think it's not possible for us to solve this in, in a year or two years or five years. Absolutely, perfect. Uh, can I uh, raise one or two concerns, uh, one or two issues? Yes, please go ahead. This is the time for it. <laughs> yeah. No time like the present. Sid, uh, thanks a lot. I remember we had a discussion uh, a lot uh, too. But uh, I, I, I think there is one more issue which we need to do is there's a lack of clarity on problem statements. So where I think you guys can contribute a lot. Uh, narrowing down to specific problem statements which India needs to work on for our academy, for our industry, for our uh, startups and innovators. Uh, because there, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, simultaneous uh, work being done world over. So somewhere I think you can lay down a few, uh, you know, areas which we, India should focus on. Because you know what is happening globally. You, now you have spent very long time following the technological leads around the world. So I think uh, the small uh, two, three uh, key areas which India should work on. Thanks. If you could uh, guide me on this. Um, of course, of course. So maybe, I mean, during the next uh, few calls, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, what, what I, will, I would be very interested in having a look at the book you mentioned you've written, because uh, if that helps us, uh, we can start off a discussion maybe on a formal basis as well. If you could link that in somewhere, so maybe uh, in the yeah, it's, it's available. Uh, uh, I'll do that. I'll do that. It's okay. India's quest for UAVs and challenges. It is available in our Amazon, and I will send you link. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Rishi, would you like to keep going? Uh, more question and answers. Um, no, that's about it here. And then, um, yeah, the testing site and uh, uh, no, I think uh, there's one on the feedback form. Um, from Manish, I think. No. Mayank, sorry, Mayank Janeja. Uh, just Did you have that open up? Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, after that, maybe you could just quickly review whatever's already been answered, maybe make sure that they are answered. <laughs> yeah. Um, just one minute. I think I lost my. Um, so I'll help you out, Rishi. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll help you out, uh, Rishi. So the point is that uh, what, what Mayank is asking is where do FPVs fit into our concept of operations? Because with the goggles, they can actually go out to a longer range and uh, uh, they are still not VLOS operations. So how does that fit in? So uh, Mayank, uh, my answer to that would be uh, that... Uh, from a safety perspective, the issue of, with FPV flying is that uh, the drone itself should not become a safety hazard for any other flying object or uh, or any any other prop property on ground, etc. So, 
the the challenges are twofold in fpv flying so uh, first is that the person who's flying the drone is actually doing it for his enjoyment uh, it's kind of a competitive sport or whatever uh, it is or, or maybe just enjoying the views from from that perspective but where the drone physically is and because the camera angles etc have their own limitations so trying to ensure that the drone is free from other obstructions how is the pilot getting that assistance so there are there are to my understanding there are multiple ways people do it including having uh, uh, people spotting on lookout or operating them in areas which are known to be free from obstructions etc so in our concept if you if you were to try and fit that kind of operation the idea is uh, it would come into the extended wheel loss thing because you are uh, uh, from a from a safety perspective you would be uh, uh, interested in ensuring that this drone even if it's being flown fpv is not going to pose a challenge to any anything else and so therefore it comes in the velos uh, extended velos which is our category a operations basically the 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 person handling the drone is ensuring that the drone is not going to be a challenge for anything else and so therefore uh, uh, it's free to go it's good to go now there is no other uh, technical support required that that's my understanding if anybody wants to add to that um th thanks i think that actually covers my intent uh, but my follow up comment i think i've asked that on the form as well was some special cases of fpv flying also have a genre of long range flying which might actually entail something of the tune of maybe beyond 6 kilometers or 7 kilometers wherein you still have a active video link and uh, the, the capability of the drone in terms of the mass velocity envelope might be less uh, it could still be a sub 250 gram drone um maybe operating at modest speeds uh and it's usually done in like areas which are sparse um and uh, away from obstructions or risk to uh, like life or infrastructure but uh, just by virtue of the sheer distance of such an activity would that automatically as per your con ops promoted to a category b or because of the uh, way you answered uh, uh, the previous question it would still be a category a i would take it that so long as through direct human viewing of the drone its position is safely ensured irrespective of the range it still remains in extended wheel loss category so uh, the the primary means of identifying the position and hazard to our, uh, property and other objects in the air is the human hmm. being is giving a direct feedback to the controller because the human correct, eye correct. has the best camera angles correct correct So, so, but wait. When you mention the human aspect here, are you talking about the spotter on the ground or the guy with the, the actual pilot with the goggles? The the spotter and how he is able to uh, to uh, inform the the guy with the on controls. I see. Okay. What he what he means is there is always a human eye on the drone, so that's in, it, that way it is kept away from the other aircraft. Is that right, Amit? Uh, yes, so that's what I meant. So, so the responsibility of ensuring the safety of everything else is that of the guy operating the drone, uh, even in the FPV mode, and mm -hmm. he's using the help of external spotters, uh, human spotters, to do that. So we've listed extended uh, wheel loss in category B, minimal risk uh, in our in our. Yeah, yeah I, I stand corrected on that on whether it's yeah, category. Exactly. Yeah, but the concept is that it is it is good to go and it is in restricted category B, wheel loss and extended wheel loss. Sure, sure. Okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, Rajiv, you are still there? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, regarding this question, regarding um, the first one, uh, Amit has answered all of them. Regarding approval of drone training schools and they are revising the syllabus and things like that. Uh, uh, one more thing which I wanted to add is what Amit has given already regarding like B Tech and M Tech people uh, at formulation of syllabus for them. For drones, um, here because the industry is flush, going to be flush with lots of those uh, drones which are in the nano category and uh, my and and the next one also. What I mean to say is that do you think uh, the techno uh, B tech and M tech people should be aware of these things immediately, or is it that the people who are, let's say cat four, uh, cat D, which you are talking about, those drones require uh, people who are highly qualified in these lines? To handle, like you are talking about something like an AME requirement for a drone. You are saying, sir, uh, we are not reach. Uh, in our case, uh, we are uh, most of our work in India is being done in a uh, 
um, software field. Uh, we are developing, some of us are developing um, autopilot, some of them are you know, integrating them. Uh, most of the hardware is not being done. Designing is hardly any, anything is being done. Mm -hmm. So, um, 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 though uh, individual exceptions, I will not count them as a normal. Mm -hmm. So, effectively, if I have to see as a whole, Indian mm -hmm. ecosystem is pro proceeding more towards a low value industry, development of a low value industry. If we want to develop a high value industry, then the research, designing, those aspects have to come into it. Now, what pace and what uh, speed we have to develop, I will not uh, go. That technical experts can de uh, define. But as a whole, we are still um, uh, a low value uh, innovation ecosystem in India. Okay. okay. So that's it. Okay. So yeah, that is we why talk was... about it, about incentivizing R&D a little bit in the commentary articles. Maybe you can have a look at that. Give us your feedback. That would be okay. very much appreciated. Got it. Thanks. Sorry. Oh, oh, one quick question before the uh, other panelists, uh, I mean, the other attendees uh, uh, of specific feedback. So uh, uh, the, the whole idea of having a graduated approach and a uh, 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 thing to that end, does that hold water or do you, do you find major holes in that? Um, the, I personally find there are holes. Uh, um, graduated is a, very much a requirement. But if you look at the academic field, we are not even touching upon. The nobody is discussing. Individual professors are doing their own research. So there's no deliberation on what should be our uh, syllabus from five years from hence. I don't think there's even a deliberation. Thank you. So possibly you're connected uh, on the uh, education front more than we are. <laughs> we have definitely like to have a bit more insight into how it is, what the state uh, is no, currently. No, I will even talk about second phase. If you talk about the innovation uh, or the integration projects, uh, uh, you see the FAS uh, drone integration projects being undertaken, ASA's drone project, the airborne systems being developed, the ground ground systems being developed. And you tell me one system being developed in India? So I think these are the issues they are getting, uh, barring the eye spirits, uh, hard work in the you know digital uh, um, sky ecosystem and the NPNT system. As a state, the acceptability of high spirits work within the state was so less because they were not technically tuned to accept that. And they didn't have any, they were not the stakeholders. You know, it was the high spirit banging their head to accept it. And even today, they have not put it in the policy. Yes. Now, that is one of the key learnings that we uh, have tried to work with. We are now understand from looking back at past uh, a few years that uh, maybe you need to change our approach a little bit, bring on more stakeholders and sort of make them part of the discussion rather than, especially on the hardware training, uh, pilot licensing, and the quality control and insurance and certification side as well. So it's not just getting a software solution, it's also hardware. Okay, uh, one, other, uh, one more point I would like to talk about. You have raised about a standard, but who's going to do it in India? Uh, yes, so in fact, uh, I mean, we, we are try, starting to get into that discussion ourselves to some extent, uh, at least on the UTM policy. So maybe I could show you a few more things if uh, uh, towards the end, let's, unless there's anything else, we could sort of show them our uh, knowledge base and uh, UTM uh, policy, what we are actually trying to come up for the next stage. Uh, one thing which I want to ask, Rajiv, uh, what Amit, I think, asked is, do you feel our approach to this is uh, on the right lines or not? Because you have been in the stream for some time. I think that is what Amit was asking, right? Sir, like, my, my, my only, um, uh, some of the work which is being done by Spirit, everything what they have done is wonderful because uh, my country was not thinking on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think um, I, I'm just probing um, uh, I swear to think on areas uh, like uh, let's say talk about certification uh, QCI has been told to do certification yes uh, standards uh, is um, you know uh, it's a vague area but uh, um, BIS is thinking of taking up standard but I really don't know whether they have the expertise which I uh, get an initial impression they don't so um, the I think those areas also have to be addressed uh, oh, absolutely. Okay. So uh, some of the things, so we're actually now we're trying to come up with, 
get to a stage where we are in a position to uh, come up with technical standards, let's say at least on the UTM side, so which will hopefully inform all the other uh, on the hardware side as well in terms of, uh, so this is, okay, this is the actual gone off the document. Uh, we're currently working on UTM policy. So these are what we, uh, other things we are working on. Uh, technical standards is on the timeline. Uh, so maybe next few months we'll be actually looking at it. Uh, and that then we'll start getting into, okay, whatever's left. So that might be, we need to bring on hardware experts and uh, talk to research and development institutions to formulate how to go ahead with uh, certification for airworthiness and other, other, uh, other standards, not just yeah, I, I think we need to also work on institution creation. creation uh, like, uh, oh, like Yes, yes, yes. That's the major thing. So we obviously our view is that we should take this STV kind of approach, uh, but we do have to detail it out and give them a proper straight sort of step-by-step -step approach of how this is actually going to work. So that might be uh, part of the future discussions, definitely. Thank you. Sorry, yeah, George, you were saying something? No, no, nobody else other than SSJ. I don't know who is SSJ. He has said that. Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, finally, maybe uh, our team and I mean, everybody, if you would like to turn on your uh, cameras, say hi properly. <laughs> if, if you like, uh, any last few words? And uh, maybe you can conclude our session today. Obviously, the feedback. Uh, channel is still open through the Google Forms. You can uh, have a look at the CONOPS offline, put in your comments. Uh, we'd love to have a look at it. If you uh, do put in your email so that we can get back to you.